Well, we are very excited to have Dr. Mamka An Anyona with us today. It's a, a really important uh, to have somebody with an African perspective uh, to be a part of the lecture series. So we're very grateful that she could come. And she also has some great experience and expertise to share with us. She is the policy and strategy lead for the UN Multi-Partner Trust Fund for Non-Communicable Diseases and Mental Health. And she's from Kenya originally, where she trained and practiced as a clinician. I read that her interest in non-communicable disease prevention and control was peaked while she was was peaked while she was working as a dental surgeon in Kenya's public healthcare system, serving rural populations uh, who are who were severely underserved and. Um, with respect to access to these non-communicable diseases uh, services. Uh, so she had that drive that took her to for on to further education. She went on to earn a Master's of International Health from the University of Copenhagen and a doctorate from Harvard's, Harvard University's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She has a decade of experience in global health working on health systems and the prevention and management of chronic diseases. She has worked at the Open Society Foundation on Global Health Financing and represented that foundation on the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria Governance Board. She's also worked with the World Bank as well with, as, well as with various national governments. And I'm excited to have her here and we'll just welcome her and turn the time over to her. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, where to begin? So thank you for the kind introduction. I had no idea that you had somehow found my bio online because I know I didn't share that. Um, but some of those things are true. <laughs> so uh, today we're going to talk about why we should decolonize global health. Um, I do not know how much history all of you have about global health, how much you know about global health, but because you're at this center, I imagine you have a global outlook uh, and you plan a career that at least considers the world around you beyond uh, the world you exist in. And so this is, a, this is the right moment for you to think about this because the, a lot of the world is thinking about this, especially in the context of the pandemic. Uh, it has really brought to the fore why we need to be thinking about what it is that ails the global health system. So, um, so I think the, f the first, where we should begin is to think about global health uh, and think about how it is defined um, and how it actually is practiced. So when you read, there's so many different definitions of global health, and I gave one that is uh, relatively uh, generic, but also relatively popular by Copeland uh, from 2009, which is an area for study, research, and practice that places a priority on improving health and achieving health equity for all people worldwide. So when you read a lot of these definitions of global health, they don't seem very different from the definition of public health as you would define it in the context of a country or a region. The only addition tends to be that, you know, expounding it to an international platform. But is, when you say global health, is that what you actually think about? Do you think that, oh, it's just public health the way we do it here in Utah, the way we do it in New York City, but we just do it on a global platform? Is that what you think about? Probably not. You probably think that, no, global health looks a certain way. And it probably looks like those pictures right there. And none of those pictures represent what you would see in Utah or in New York City. So global health means, in practice, something very, very different from what the definitions or the, the conceptual definitions and the academic de definitions actually, actually are able to convey. And we need to be able to get at that, to get at what is that different thing that you see in your mind when you think of global health and how do we define it? And so in 2020, uh, that is last year, uh, King and Kosky wrote this paper that is really wonderful, and I, I have a reading list, and it includes at the end of the slides, and it includes this paper, which I would recommend if anyone is interested, that has what I th would think of as a de facto definition of global health, what it is we think about when we think about global health, especially in settings such as this, that it is public health practiced somewhere else. And I don't even think this goes far enough, because it's somewhere else, but where is that somewhere else? And how does that somewhere else relate to where it is that we're coming from when we're defining 
uh, uh, public health. So, so this brings us to the question of, you know, so, so what, is, what is global health? So who does global health? And who is global health done to? Because clearly when you look at the pictures here, there is a dynamic between the doer and the person to whom it is done. There's a dynamic between the agent and the subject. So there is an agent and there is a subject in global health. Whereas in public health, when you think about public health in any, uh, in any discrete context, this is not how you actually really think about it. Sorry, they want me, this might happen. So who does global health and who is it done to? So to demonstrate, uh, as just an, 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 an exemplar of who it is that does global health, uh, there, are, there is a report that is done, I think it is every two years or so, uh, by Global Health 5050, that is called the Power, Privilege, and Priorities Report. The last one was released in 2020 and focused on gender, but even in, uh, uh, within the focus of gender, they also, um, they also focused on other uh, dimensions of inequity. And they took two... Uh, I took two graphics to kind of help us think through this concept of who practices global health and, and who is it done to. So of the 198 leading global health institutions across the world, this is the dis def distribution of their headquarters. So these are institutions that, as we now seem to understand, practice mostly in what we call the developing world, low and middle income countries. But the headquarters are 38% in North America, 46% in Europe, only 7% in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is also the greatest recipient of, uh, of global health practice, 5% in Asia, and 1.5% in Latin America, which are all the, also other areas where global health is practiced. And who is it that leads global health? Who is it that sets the agenda? Who is it that makes the decisions within global health? So in this lower graphic, it shows you the global population. 83% uh, are in low and middle income countries, 17% are in high income countries. Yet 83% of, uh, of global health leaders and practitioners come from high income countries and only about 13% come from low and middle income countries and of, of those only 5% are women. And even amongst the global health leaders who practice, you know, who practice global health, the vast majority of them were trained uh, in, were, were trained in uh, high income countries and a full 8% were trained in Harvard, such as myself. Would I even be here today had I not been trained in Harvard? And what does that mean? So, so now, we have, now we have a conception of global health and we have thought a little bit about what does it actually mean in practice? why, you know, there's this dynamic where global health is practiced by mostly by practitioners from high income countries, it is practiced mostly in low and middle income countries, and there is this dynamic between the agent and the subject. But why is this the case? You know, why is it that, you know, why is it that things turned out this way? You know, was it deliberate or is it, is it an art artifact of, of a history? Is it a legacy? So to understand this, you need to go back to the origins of global health. So the, the very early, you know, the very early attempts at having some kind of cross-border cross or international interaction around health uh, is in the colonial era. Uh, and this is, the, so the first, uh, what is called the International Sanitary Conference was held in 1851 in Paris. And the point of these early conferences, there were four of these international um, uh, sanitary conferences, the point of them was to address, you know, once there was a, uh, uh, intercontinental trade and there was intercontinental um, activity around uh, especially the colonial activity, it was important to address how diseases were transmitted between the countries. As you well understand, there were outbreaks of cholera, outbreaks of yellow fever, and a lot of other uh, emerging infectious diseases at the time. And the leaders of these countries needed to meet to discuss how it is that they would have some kind of coordinated quarantine protocols coordinated uh, you know, policies uh, in place in the different places to ensure that, that the diseases are not spread from, uh, from the colonial countries to the colonizing countries, basically. And so this was called colonial medicine. And in its later iterations, it was called tropical medicine. And it very explicitly sought to, uh, very explicitly sought to protect 
the, uh, the populations of high income countries from diseases, from what are called tropical diseases that came from the colonial, uh, from the colonial countries. So right from the beginning, global health was steeped in a very, uh, a very strong uh, power imbalance. And so this, you know, the, the early colonial medicine, tropical medicine uh, evolved uh, after after World War II, and after the the the, the uh, after the wars of independence across Africa, into what was then called international health. So international health tried to you know tr international health was happening in a very different world. This was a post colonial world. So the so the in, you know the direct uh, relationship between uh, colonizing countries and colonial countries did not exist anymore. But there was still a need to maintain. Uh, there was still a need to maintain some kind of order around uh, around health and public health generally to be able so that the uh, so that the wealthier countries at the time would be able to manage uh, the cross border. Uh, Contamination, as it were, and this is what spurred the international health uh, in the in in this era. Something else also happened in this era is that it, this was the beginning of the era of philanthropy, where there was this, uh, and it began actually in America uh, with the with the philanthropic missions to uh, to deworm and to eliminate uh, eliminate uh, what you call today the neglected tropical diseases. Uh, and a lot of this was also exported as part of international health. So this introduced a very different dynamic, but the power dynamics between the countries, you know, between the agent and the subject remained. And then all of this changed in the globalization era. So international health evolved into global health and the use of the, glo of the term global health uh, was, you know, came into use mostly uh, within the 90s, but it really spiked in the 2000s, and it represented a change as well. It represented a change from a world in which, you know, a world in which the, a, a world in which health needed to be managed between countries, it was a cross-border management of, of, of health conditions, into an understanding of interdependence, that the world was very interdependent, it was interdependent economically, it was interdependent uh, socially, and in this globalization era, global health was born. And global health bears a lot of the history of, uh, of its antecedents of international health, of colonial medicine, but at the same time, global health aims to do something beyond just managing cross-border uh, diseases. Global health intends to address, you know, to address these shared problems of our day, such as non-communicable diseases, which is what I work in, such as climate change. So, uh, and, and the health impacts of climate change, such as uh, antimicrobial resistance, which we know are, 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 are rising health issues that defy borders. So global health in, in principle and in practice is different from international health, which was different in principle and in practice from colonial medicine. But across all these different eras, it has maintained it has still maintained this dynamic that you think of in your mind when you think of global health. There is an agent and there is a subject. So at this point, I think I, would, I, I want to stop a little uh, and, 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 and let us think about global health in practice today. And you know, if global health is not global, and if global health maintains a, a dynamic that is a, a certain dynamic, how does that dynamic play out when we actually have a global health challenge? Uh, and is it to our advantage or is it not to our advantage? I need to be blunt. The world is on the brink of a catastrophic moral failure. And the price of this failure will be paid with lives and livelihoods in the world's poorest countries. At the first vaccines begin to be deployed, the promise of equitable access is at serious risk. More than 39 million doses of vaccine have now been administered in at least 49 higher income countries. Just 25 doses have been given in one lowest income country. Not 25 million, not 25,000 just 25. Even as they speak the language of equitable access, 
some countries and companies continue to prioritize bilateral deals. Going around commerce, driving up prices, and attempting to jump to the front of the queue. This is wrong. 44 bilateral deals were signed last year, and at least 12 have already been signed this year. Not only does this me first approach leave the world's poorest and most vulnerable people at risk, it's also self defeating. Ultimately, these actions will only prolong the pandemic, prolong our pain. The restrictions needed to contain it and human and economic suffering. Thank you. You can go back to the slides now. Sorry about that. Um, so as you can hear from, the, uh, from this video, when global health was actually faced with a global health challenge, you know, in this era of global health, that is, you know, the rhetoric is about international cooperation. This is no longer about just aid, it's about international cooperation because we understand we are interdependent and all this uh, really beautiful rhetoric. But when uh, the tires meets the road, as they say, what happened is that a lot of the countries who dominate global health, who set the global health agenda, closed ranks on themselves. And they, you know, in in the in in what ended up being this, you know, rush for supplies at the very beginning of the of the pandemic, rush for masks, rush, uh, rush for PPEs. These countries that ha are economically advanced and therefore have more power in the market ended up, you know, uh, ended up hoarding all the supplies and uh, completely disadvantaging the countries uh, that, you know, that global health purports to care about, purports to want to be supporting. And uh, in the context of vaccinations specifically, uh, you know, this video is from a few months ago. At the moment, uh, the, the numbers in terms of vaccination remain pretty dire in low and middle income countries. A lot of countries have not even reached 3% vaccination coverage, yet wealthy countries are already giving booster shots. And so, the rhetoric of international cooperation, the rhetoric of, 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 of service, the rhetoric of, of, of um, shared, uh, shared uh, outcomes does not play out when we're actually faced with a, with, an, uh, with a global health challenge, which means that the structure of global health as it is, is actually a disadvantage to the world in general because as Ted Rose says, says in this video or the video that we just saw, the pandemic will only continue to fulminate as long as there are places where people are not getting vaccinated and so new variants are forming and those variants may soon overtake the even the booster shots and then we'll all end up in the same place again so so the power dynamic that we talk about in uh, in global health is disadvantageous to the whole world it's not only disadvantageous to the countries uh, to whom you know to the subject countries as it were So this brings us to the question of decolonizing global health. So why is it that we then now talk about decolonizing global health? Why is it that, you know, over the past year, this has become, you know, uh, there were more than 50 academic articles written between January and December of 2020 on decolonizing global health? Why is it that, you know, what is the momentum around this? So decolonizing global health as a movement, uh, as the movement as it's known today, actually began in the United States in rooms such as this ones. It was uh, a, a, a academics of global health in, uh, in West, in Western countries, specifically the United States, who said there's something wrong with this. We need to start thinking through this. Uh, we need to start uh, dismantling this power dynamic uh, and create an egalitarian system uh, of global health. But before we go into that, let's think about what decolonization is. So decolonization happens on two dimensions. They, you know, as, as we understand decolonization uh, as, the, as the movement that happened in the 19th and 20th century uh, in Latin America and in Africa, to, you know, to basically remove the, uh, the colonial governments and, and, and to achieve self-determination. Uh, so that is one aspect of it for these countries to form nation states where they have self-determination. So that is one area of it. But the other aspect of, uh, of decolonization is how it is we create global institutions that perpetuate self-determination, that, uh, that um, 
that make it easier to have egalitarian international order rather than perpetuating the system such as uh, what we have in global health today. And so one loose definition, so glo uh, decolonizing global health is not well defined anywhere really, but one definition that is given is this one that I have used here, is to remove all forms of supremacy within all spaces of global health practice within countries, between countries and at global level. So my own conception of uh, de decolonizing global health goes quite beyond this. Because to me, uh, decolonizing global health is not just about the movement that is happening today, that is gaining uh, ground on the Lancet or on Twitter. Decolonizing global health, as, to me, is just a continuation of a process that started in Haiti in 1791 when the slaves revolted and they got independence from France. That set off a cascade of events here in the United States as well, uh, across Africa, across Latin America, and countries, uh, and more and more countries, and to this day, almost every country in the world has self-determination, and almost every country in the world is a nation state. But that happened at the national level. The global order remained, col remained colonial. We never really made an attempt to try and address how these global institutions maintain that sense of self-determination. So when you go to most countries, even my own country, Kenya, today, a lot of the health agenda is not set by the Ministry of Health or by the needs on the ground. It is set by the donors. So what does that mean? It means that the, the global institutions still maintain control that makes it impossible to have the self-determination that, uh, that, the, that the Haitian slaves were revolting for in 1791. So to me, this is an, in, an incomplete, uh, it's an incomplete process that is just continuing something that's already happening. And so this happens on three levels as we have already seen. There's the historical uh, you know, uh, colonial artifact. There's also the, the effects of neocolonization, which is what I'm describing. And there's the practice of global health that is colonial, that, that you know, this is one of the last areas where people will come from one country and go to another country to do things to people in that other country, and that is socially sanctioned. To make decisions in that country, to affect the lives of people in that other country, and that is socially sanctioned. In many other areas uh, of, 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 of uh, society, this doesn't happen anymore. But in global health, it remains one, uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, one of the last bastions of socially sanctioned imperialism. So to me, decolonizing global health has to has to take that history into consideration it has to take you know it has to walk that path uh, and to have this really uncomfortable conversations uh, and to do the difficult work of dismantling this implicit and explicit stru explicit structures that perpetuate this uh, this uh, dynamic to uh, to create what I think of as an egalitarian inter international public health order so why should we decolonize global health I mean because we could decide to each go our own way. Do we need a global health? Do we need to cooperate at the international level at all around health? I think the past two years uh, answer that question quite well for us. We absolutely must. Um, and so it is very necessary for us to decolonize global health because as we have seen, for an egalitarian international order will be better placed to deal with issues such as pandemics. It will be better placed to deal with, uh, with the priorities uh, as, as they come rather than priorities that are set by people who do not leave the experience of the kind of, uh, of, the kind of decisions that they're making. So to demonstrate that, I, this is another, one of, uh, another uh, graphic that comes from the report on power, privilege, and priorities that shows you know, that at the very top, the yellow and blue, are the different uh, uh, global burdens of disease by different disease area. And the second to show you the, the amount of priority that is given to these different areas, uh, these different areas uh, of health, showing you very clearly that just because something is a health need doesn't mean that it receives uh, uh, attention from global health because global health does not respond to the needs. So an, an egalitarian decolonized global health system will be able to allocate resources as they are needed across the different health, uh, uh, d uh, across the different health needs. And really that is what evidence-based public health would be. So equity uh, is also another very important reason to decolonize global health. In and of itself, it is a worthy outcome uh, and uh, for self-determination uh, because it is important for people. It, it, first of all, it is inevitable that people will always strive towards self-determination. So even the call uh, for decolonizing global health fits very well in human history. Uh, wherever humans are, they will always try to unshackle themselves for whatever it is that keeps them from attaining freedom. Um, yeah. 
Oh, sorry, I think that slide, I was going to remove that slide. I was going to remove that slide because I, 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 I went back and forth between talking about what a decolonized global health system looks like. And I, because this is an ongoing conversation, I thought it better to not go there because there's still a lot uh, that is being discussed. And I think that the material we've covered today is enough to get us to think uh, and for the purposes of this seminar. Uh, and here's a, bibliog a bibliography and reading list, which I invite you to browse at your own uh, leisure. Uh, all these papers are really, really good to read. Um, and that ends my lecture. And now I invite you to ask questions, if you have any. So my name is Caleb Harding. I'm a computer science major. Um, so I'm not super familiar with the UN or other kind of international organizations in the health like realm. I know the UN Security Council has like multiple sitting members that kind of have most of the power. But I guess is there like a similar phenomenon in the health arena or what sort of like structural changes does the UN or other organizations need to make it more like egalitarian? I don't know if that makes sense. Shall I take every question as it comes? Or? Yeah. OK, great. So the World Health Organization, which is where I work, mm -hmm. is actually a member state organization. It has 194 member states, and the decisions are made by the World Health Assembly, which is representatives from all these states, because it was an attempt to have this democratic uh, way of decision making around health. But two things. One, uh, the, the UN system generally, and the WHO itself, is not funded through uh, through these mandatory uh, contributions that every country makes. Uh, only about 30% of WHO's funding comes from that. 70% has to be, they have to fundraise from other mm -hmm. sources. And when they fundraise from other sources, those other sources end up with a disproportionate amount of power in the WHO's decision making. We saw this last year when the US decided to withdraw from the WHO, being one of its largest funders, meaning that whatever you think of, you know, what the merits of the case, WHO has disproportionate power. Uh, the US has dispropor disproportionate power in determining WHO's um, decisions because it can unilaterally demolish the organization by, you know, if they disagree. So that is one. The second is that there are many other um, international institutions in global health that are not WHO and are not democratic. Uh, that are, you know, they're good institutions, they do good work, but they, but because they're not uh, democratic institutions, uh, and they hold, like, the Bill and Melinda Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, Bill Gates has a lot of say in what happens in global health, but uh, he's not held to account by anybody. So, you know, for better or worse, it means that, you know, it means that there is this power dynamic that remains you know, whether good is being done or not. So uh, one of the solutions uh, to uh, decolonizing global health, as far as I'm concerned, is having higher mandatory uh, contributions from countries that make sure that the WHO uh, is at least 80 or 90 percent funded through these mandatory contributions so it can actually reflect it's actually the needs of the countries rather than reflecting the needs of the funders and also strengthening the WHO so that it takes its rightful place in global health decision making that at the moment is skewed towards other institutions that have more money and therefore more power in global health. But that's a very good question. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. That was a really good answer. Hi, uh, my name is Soraya Roberts. I'm a theater arts studies major. Um, what is something that we as individuals can do to promote global health? To promote global health or yeah, to, to like promote an egalitarian international health order? The second one. <laughs> so this is an interesting one, which is partly why I did not add the slide at the end, because, um, because we do, we are in the United States. We are, you know, the United States has disproportionate power uh, in global health. And so when thinking about what it is you can do, you always have to have in mind as an American, not myself, even myself to some extent, because I'm American trained and I live in America, that we already enter in the world of global health, we enter with a certain amount of power that, um, that who our interlocutors elsewhere will not have. So having that awareness in the first place, I think, takes us very far. 
having that consciousness, being aware of that dynamic in any global health interaction or even any international interaction, I think uh, is a very good place to start. Um, and doing any work that I think or you will come across that will um, that you think is dismantling the system rather than reinforcing the system and asking the difficult questions. For example, if you had a research grant or you're working with a professor with a research grant and they go to Guatemala and, you know, the and then they publish a paper and everybody on that paper is from BYU, you would ask, why is this happening? You know, we are taking information from people and not giving them any credit for it and they're not you know so thinking about day-to-day -day interactions in the world of global health and in the in your own interactions i think is a place to begin but i am one of those people that doesn't like putting the onus on individuals because i, I think a lot of the structural problems need structural solutions uh, but i hope that that's i know that's an insufficient answer but no thank you very much yeah I'm Brooklyn Williams. I'm a public health major. Um, I don't totally know how to phrase this quite yet, but I feel like in the last, especially few months, there's been kind of a disconnect between the perspective of the WHO and more like United States organizations like the CDC, mm -hmm. um, especially with like recommendations for vaccines like you addressed with um, like booster shots and stuff like that. Um, how do we go about balancing like who sh not who should we trust but like when there is that discrepancy between like authority figures that don't have any official authority in our legislation like how do we go about that as just citizens of the world <laughs> that is actually a really good question and one that i think a lot of my friends ask me now that they're thinking about booster shots because i've done a lot of work around vaccine equity for covid and I, again, this is partly why I push back against placing the, the onus on individuals. I don't think, like, I have my appointment on the 16th for getting my booster shot, you know. I don't think that individuals, like, the CD, if, if the CDC, the CDC makes decisions for United States citizens. And uh, it takes all the information that is available to it to make this decision. And once the, uh, the decision is made, I do not think that it is upon individuals to sacrifice themselves or matter themselves in for some greater good. But what you can do is write to your congressperson and tell them that, you know, something about vaccine equity, about, you know, uh, intellectual property rights. We didn't go too much into it today about, you know, ensuring that there are vaccines elsewhere in the world, about the stockpiling that the U.S. is doing. Those are things you can actually do that would try to impact things at a structural level without mattering yourself in the process. And of course, they're going to be this different um, they're going to be different. And again, this tension is what we're exploring today. That is global health truly global, because if global health is public health everywhere, then we would all agree to not have booster shots until everybody had, you know. But because of this power dynamics, it means that <coughs> global health is done some other places and then public health is done in other places uh, to the benefit of the people in those places. So I think that's my answer to that question. I think just get, get your booster shot, encourage your family to get their booster shot. <laughs> uh, but do what it is you can to, you know, as an American citizen, you have a lot of power in terms of pushing your representatives to represent you and your principles, I think. Or at least I've found that in the years that I've lived here. Thank you so much. That's super helpful. Hi, Mamka. Um, I'm Brian Allen, um, and I studied public health here. Um, you mentioned, like, reformations at the WHO as, like, a good goal point for decolonizing global health. I know there's a tendency within global health to kind of create an entirely new organization instead of fix what's broken. Um, and I'd, I'd wonder what your reflections are in the like create a new and reform debate that's kind of going on around the WHO. So that's a really interesting question because that also raises a very different question which I was grappling with as I was preparing for this talk is the question uh, between revolution and reform because 
those and those are two different conversations because one is do we support uh, the WHO or do we do those who have power as you know that we will, is what will happen go and create some other institution mm -hmm. versus do we support WHO on this other hand or completely demolish these things and have some kind of egalitarian system that is you know that um, that everybody feels comfortable with so I don't think either of those two extremes will happen because it's just you know, the nature of the world today is so precarious that we cannot exist without the WHO as it exists. Um, but I think that reforming it is difficult. It is a very, I work there, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it is, oof, it is a bureaucracy that is, that is, has, you know, the, the, a lot of what is ailing it is very entrenched within it, but any effort we can make to improve what we have, I think, is better than uh, than either of the options mm -hmm. because any new institution that is made is going to be made by people with power and it's going to have the same inherent dynamics. And one of the things that WHO has, which is what I was saying earlier, is that it is the only democratic institution, not fully democratic, not even, you know, not even uh, mostly democratic, but only demo ad uh, organization that attempts at a democratic way of decision making around global health. And we cannot sacrifice that. I do not think we can sacrifice that. Uh, another thing to remember is that WHO was formed as part of the UN system that was formed after the Second World War. The pain that the world had to go through to come up with the UN and to develop a system that tries to manage our problems instead of going to war with one another, you know, it, it's not something you can replicate unless we are all willing to go to war again, which I don't think we are. So I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Monk. I appreciate yeah. it. Hello. Um, my name is Sydney Rogers. I'm undecided. Um, I was wondering if you, um, if you think there are any negative side effects to decolonizing global health um, and or um, just describing what it will look like when um, global, or you know, when or if global health is decolonized. Can you give me an example? Um, of like when it is decolonized. Um, yeah. What like negative consequences could you foresee? Um, just with like the different like. Um, like when the power distribution, uh, like mm -hmm. when the power is dis dis distributed, then like how would that um, like look, like how would it be different? Maybe not necessarily any negative consequences, but like um, how would it look differently? So the difficult thing is, uh, and there's actually a paper that was published uh, by uh, say a bimbo, I actually think, I think it's one, it's one of the papers here that is it possible to decolonize global health and another one on, you know, will global health survive decolonization? Um, you know, we don't know what a decolonized global health world looks like. The same way, you know, those slaves who are revolting in Haiti had no idea what their world was going to look like. Um, and so it's, it's difficult to say, but it's impossible to suppress the desire for self-determination. There's just no putting the genie back in the bottle. One of the things that's discussed quite openly uh, uh, about, you know, ceding power to countries around global health uh, is human rights. Is this concern that, you know, that uh, the way global health is done through aid forces countries that would otherwise not grant human rights to grant them. Uh, I think it's obvious where I fall <laughs> on that on that argument. I think that countries have to have their own evolution as every other country has had socially. And I think that any imposition of policy will always have more negative consequences than positive ones. And I think the world, I mean, this country is built on the concept of freedom. So I think we're very right at the heart of self-determination. Uh, so I think whatever negative you know, consequences there are, you know, the same way that the negative consequences of self-determination here have made the pandemic prolonged. <laughs> uh, you know, I think that they are, they're always better than otherwise. At least that is my position. That's where I fall on this. But of course, there are a lot of interesting debates happening around what could be lost if that power dynamic is lost and if that carrot and stick is given away. Hello, um, my name is Annalise Tutasi and I'm also a public health major, 
And I remember um, in your introduction, they said how you also work in mental health. So I was wondering, um, do you think promoting mental health awareness in these developing countries plays a role in decolonizing global health altogether? Promote, who would be promoting it? Who's the actor in this like, case? Like um, the organizations or just anyone who's like taking part in the actual work locally? That's a good question, um, and I. And the question assumes an um, an imbalance in knowledge that there's some people who know about mental health and there's mm -hmm. some people who don't, and we're going to go and tell them about it and make their lives all better. Uh, I don't think that that's how the world plays out. I think everybody is aware of mental health. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's important to have some kind of uh, global. Uh, knowledge goods that support the work of mental health ac uh, health across the world and those are some of what we work on in who is like how do you create a system uh, that you know that uh, supports people with mental health conditions while respecting their human rights which is something that uh, no country in the world is actually doing right mm -hmm. um and you know there's a lot of global work happening but that global work that global work is not meant to be a tool that is subjected to others from others. This is just shared knowledge that we all come together and we create this knowledge and we share it. And it is as important in the United States as it is in Guinea or in Cambodia. Um, so I, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> yeah. okay. Thank you so much. Um, hi, I'm Sarah Nelson. I'm undecided. Um, one of the things that you talked about was kind of the challenge of um, that, that so many public uh, health projects are donor-based. Um, and my mom works in public health too, and she's experienced the challenge of um, doing projects where uh, the donors often have more decision-making power than like the public health experts. And so my question is, what, what do you think needs to change structurally with that system? And are there other alternative routes of funding mm -hmm. so that, um, you know, these, these public health projects can be more, uh, or so that countries can have more uh, decision-making power in their own public health uh, projects? Yeah, that's a really good question. So that question has answers on two realms. One is what happens, um, what happens domestically. So a lot of, you know, a lot of countries, in fact, people don't know this because the way the media plays it, you would think otherwise, but the vast majority of money that is invested in health and public health in countries across the world, even the poorest countries, the vast majority comes from the countries themselves. It doesn't come from donor aid. Donor aid is a tiny sliver of uh, the money that goes to countries, even amongst the poorest ones. So domestic, resource, uh, domestic resources are event always going to be the answer. Uh, the, and, and the wealthier countries grow, the more power they have, in even these interactions with donors and the less donors they actually have eventually. Um, I can give you an anecdote about Kenya. Uh, Kenya moved from being a low-income country to being a middle-income country. And uh, we had some corruption scandal with our medical supplies uh, last year. And USAID uh, wanted to tell us what to do uh, with regard to the ARVs that they were donating. And the country was just like, ship out, go. You know, you either do it the way we're going to do it or you leave. And that's the kind of power that Kenya did not have 10 years ago or 15 years ago. So domestic funding is always going, domestic decision making of any kind is always going to be the solution to any of this uh, power dynamics. The second is, the second part of, the, of that is that there is work that needs to happen at the global level. You know, for us to have a global response to COVID, there needs to be some kind of body that is paid for, that helps us to think through policy, that helps to coordinate surveillance, for us to think about mental health, we need a body that uh, is developing global goods. How do we finance that body? And so there are very many interesting uh, discussions happening around something called a global public investment, which to me doesn't read very different from what happens today to fund the UN, that every country is uh, required to give a certain amount of money based on its, um, on its GDP and its uh, population. So basically it's per capita income. Um, so I don't think 
I don't see much difference between that, but it's just kind of expanding that and, and institutionalizing it so that we're not dependent on aid is one way. There are a lot of discussions as well about innovative financing mechanisms such as a financial transaction tax. So France was pushing this a lot over the past many years, uh, which basically would mean that every time there is some kind of uh, financial transaction, which I, you know, you say stocks are traded and all these interesting things are done on Wall Street, a tax is placed on this uh, on this trading, and that goes into a, a global pot, and that is used for global public goods and not just for health for climate change, for all sorts of things. So I think that those two things is like, how do we ensure the countries, you know, gain economic advancement so they can uh, take care of their own domestic needs, but how do we also finance uh, the need for global public goods? Uh, so these discussions are happening. They're interesting. They're not moving as fast as I wish they would, but yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. Dr. Leslie Hadfield from Africana Studies. I just want to ask one last question. I'm thinking about your perspective where you are working in these rural communities in Kenya. Now you're at the WHO with the global perspective. What along the way, what or who um, has come to your mind often as you think about these questions of decolonizing global health? Do you mean as a, like a person I look a up person, to? A person, right, a person or an experience. Wow. <laughs> there have been a lot of negative ones. <laughs> uh, oof, that's a difficult one to think about. Um, that's an interesting one to think about. What or who? Can I answer that? Later at dinner? <laughs> yes, of course, of course. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you so thank much. You. It was a great question. I think that's it, right? Yeah. Thank you so much for coming and thank you for staying. Uh, I know some had to leave to go to a different class, but this was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much.